Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. And we also are grateful for those who find ways of expressing their love to you in return. And we pray that you will help each of us to be that kind of follower of yours, that we will show some very practical ways of showing our love for you and for others. So bless your word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. How important do you think etiquette is, having good manners? Do you think it's important to observe all the P's and Q's when you entertain a guest? Well, if you answered yes to these questions, you would not have sided with Simon in this story. The text is one of the the great stories, great short stories in the Bible, and you might call it, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Simon had invited Jesus to his home for dinner, and exactly why he invited Jesus, we don't know. He obviously had heard about Jesus and, um, and, and heard how popular he was, that just masses, crowds of people would follow him. And he might have thought, you know, it would be kind of fun to entertain a celebrity. So that might have been one of the reasons why he chose to invite Jesus for dinner. On the other hand, Simon the Pharisee may have heard Jesus preaching he would have heard that Jesus, God, loves sinners. And the Pharisees, they had a hard time with that concept because they realized and believed that God cared for the righteous who kept the law. So Simon may have thought that, well, Jesus is just starting out in uh, his ministry, is just a, a young rabbi, and um, maybe he could correct and mold him so that he would become more like one of us. And as a group, the elders could come together and offer their advice to him. And uh, Jesus had already declared himself to be a prophet, so Simon thought, well, maybe this needs to be investigated further. And so he planned a meal and invited Jesus for the meal. And just as soon as Jesus enters the room, in Simon's house, there is tension. It was customary for three things to happen when you invited a guest to your home. First of all, you would give them a kiss of welcome. The second thing, you would offer water for them to wash their feet because they just had open sandals, their feet would be dusty, so that was the second way of showing respect to your guests. And then they would offer some oil on the person's head. So the kiss was a mark of affection, the water to help them to uh, take the dust from their feet, and the oil, a kind of aromatic perfume. And uh, the parallel in our day would be uh, like when someone comes to visit us, we either shake their hands or uh, we give them a a hug. We offer to take their coat. Uh, We might offer them something to drink or something to eat. And then we offer them a place to sit. And these are common courtesies that we normally offer to anyone who is our guest. Well, the same was true of the things that I mentioned, the kiss, the water, and the oil. And to omit them in that time uh, was a breach of etiquette and an act of unkindness. So here we have a host who forgot his manners. And to any onlooker that day, this would have been a calculated and pointed insult. And Jesus was certainly aware of this omission. He would have had the right to look at Simon and say, I see that I'm not welcome here, and leave with anger. But Jesus did not respond that way 
to the host who forgot his manners. However, there was an onlooker who did notice the insult to Jesus. And this onlooker was very deeply affected by it. Now, before we get into um, that aspect of this, there's some information that we need to know about the setting in which this dinner took place. In those days, formal dinner parties often took place in an open courtyard. And often in the courtyard, there would be a garden, and there would be a fountain. And it was a custom that when a rabbi was at a meal at such a house, all kinds of people would come in. They felt free to stand or sit around the edges of the courtyard, and they would observe the dinner party as it took place. They weren't considered guests, but they weren't considered as intruders either. They were self-invited observers who would listen to the pearls of wisdom that the rabbi would share with the crowd that day. Now, how would you feel if you were having a dinner in your backyard and it was open so that people could see, and all of a sudden people started gathering around your yard, listening to the conversation and looking at what kind of food you were offering? How would you feel about that? Well, anyways, that's the way things were in the first century. And another thing about... Uh, the dinner in those days, the guests didn't sit on chairs, but they were seated on low couches, and they rested on their left elbow, and the right hand was free for them to stretch and to reach for their food. And during the meal, their sandals were taken off, and that fact will become important as the story unfolds. Well, what happens next is amazing. An unidentified woman enters. And some way, this woman had found out that Jesus was going to be a guest at Simon the Pharisee's home. And it is obvious that she had already known about Jesus. She knew of his love for sinners. And she had experienced the forgiving grace of God in her life. And so she wants to come and offer her thanks and admiration to the person who had turned her life around. Now, Simon knows who this woman is, and he assumes that she's the same woman that she's always been, and she was a woman that had a pretty bad reputation. The Bible said, said about her that it's very discreet in calling her a woman who had lived a sinful life. And it's a delicate way of saying that she was a prostitute. But now, this woman's life has been changed. But for Simon, she is still a sinner. And in ordinary times, Simon and this woman would never, ever have met. He would not go near a woman like that, and she would not go near a man like him. They are from opposite ends of the spectrum. And yet, strangely, they are thrown together for the same purpose. They both want to meet Jesus. Now, since verse 37 says that she had lived a sinful life in that town. People in that town knew who she was, and when she walked into the room, every head turned, and they followed her. No doubts there were whispers and quick flashes of disapproval. Why on earth is she here at Simon's dinner? And it doesn't take long for them to figure that out. She is there to meet Jesus. And so she walks around to the couch where Jesus is, is reclining. The center of attention now becomes the woman of the street. What is she going to do next? And Simon watches unbelievingly 
as this woman does something to him that is very strange. She had planned to anoint Jesus' hands and head with expensive perfume, and that's what she had brought with her. And she had planned just to do that. But when she comes into the room, she realizes that Jesus' feet had not been washed. And so she needed a bowl of water, but she knew that they would not offer her water to wash Jesus' feet because Simon was trying to embarrass Jesus. You see, she thought that they would have done all of these courtesies because that's the thing that you do when you invite someone for dinner. So this insult to Jesus, that not even the simplest courtesies were extended to him, affected her deeply. And as she looked down at his dusty feet, tears began to fall. And um, she realized, well, I don't have any water to wash his feet. But the tears had already started to flow. And she thought, well, why not wash his feet with my tears? And then she thought, well, how can I dry his feet? And then she remembered her beautiful long hair. And she uh, took the braid off, opened up her hair. And this is something that you would never do in that time in public you would not expose your hair. It was always tied up in some way. And so she takes her hair and dries his feet with her hair. And she noticed, too, that uh, Jesus was not given the normal kiss of greeting. And so she kissed his feet. He was not given any anointing oil. And so she took that expensive perfume that she had brought and poured it on Jesus' feet. Now many have thought that the reason for this woman's tears were sorrow for her past. They were tears of repentance. But she had already repented. She was already living as a free woman because she had been forgiven by Jesus. And she was coming to give her thanks for what he had done in, his li in her life. And through Middle Eastern Eyes, uh, the book Kenneth Bailey wrote, he points out that many of the early uh, church fathers like Origen and Ambrose, that this is how they viewed this woman, that she came with gratitude, not with repentance, because she had already repented before she came. But if Jesus had not hu been humiliated and insulted like he was, she would simply have fallen down on her knees before him and expressed her thanks and joy at the newfound freedom that he had brought into her life. So her tears were not tears for herself, but they were tears for this loving, caring, forgiving person who had freed her from her past through the love that he showed to her. And someone didn't offer, the Simon didn't offer the simple, common courtesies. So she decided she could do that for him. She washed his feet with her tears. She dried them with her hair. Her tears were not for herself, but for the one who had been so publicly humiliated. You see, she was entering into the pain and suffering of Jesus through her actions. And this was just one of the many ways that Jesus was insulted and humiliated in his ministry here on earth. And it isn't, isn't it amazing that this woman, who was considered such a sinner by Simon and the others, that she was able to demonstrate such love for Jesus. Because she had known what humiliation was. 
she could have become very insensitive to the needs and concerns and hurts of others. But instead of turning inwards, she turned outwards. She was helping others to also experience the loving, forgiving grace of Christ. Well, the scene then shifts back to Simon, who is silently watching this shocking, sensual scene. He's never seen anything like it in all his life. It goes against all of his conservative instincts, and he is deeply offended by what this woman has done in public. A fallen woman caresses Jesus, and it bothers him. He would never have let a woman like this touch him. And the whole thing was disgusting and revolting. And listen to what he says to himself. He says, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. That's what he was saying to himself. Well, Jesus knew exactly what Simon was thinking. So he says, Simon, I have something to tell you. <clears throat> and Simon replies, thankful he says, well, tell me, teacher. Well, what do you think Jesus is going to say to Simon? Is he going to castigate him for forgetting his manners when Jesus came to his home for dinner? Is he going to ask, well, why did you invite me in the first place if you're going to treat me so shabbily? Were you trying to set up some kind of a trap? Well, Jesus doesn't say anything like that at all. He says, I want to tell you a story. And it's amazing that sometimes when things get really tense, a good story can ease a lot of tensions. So that's what Jesus does. And the story goes something like this, paraphrasing it a bit. And Jesus says, once there were two men who owed money to a moneylender. One owed him $50,000, and the other owed him $500. But neither one had the money for, to pay back the lender. And out of the goodness of this lender's heart, he canceled both of their debts. And that's a story. Very nice, simple story. Then Jesus asks Simon the $64,000 question. Which of those two men will love the lender more? Well, Simon kind of smells a trap, so he's a little cautious in the way he answers. And he says, well, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. And Jesus says, you're right, Simon, you're right. Well, what does this mean? In Simon's eyes, the woman was certainly like the one who had the debt of $50,000 that she couldn't pay back. She was an enormous sinner. And compared to her, even $500 seems far too much for the debt that he had. $5 would be more like it. But Jesus is trying to get across. That is not the point. And here's the point. If you can't pay a debt, it doesn't matter how much you owe. If you're broke, you're broke. In that sense, there's no difference between owing a little and owing a lot especially if you don't have any money. Well, the truth of the story slowly begins to seep in. Jesus is trying to get across to Simon to say, we are all in debt to God. Some owe more, some owe less. And we can't pay for the wrongs that we have done, for the things that we have not done, that we should have done. And none of us can pay even a penny to cancel the debt that we owe before God. And here's the gospel message. 
God is willing to forgive all debtors equally, the people who owe him a lot and the people who owe him little. Well, Simon is at the center of the stage and he's beginning to feel very uncomfortable because what Jesus is saying is painfully clear. Because Simon realizes that according to this story, he fits into the category of being a sinner. She was the big sinner, that woman, but he was a little sinner. But Jesus is saying there's fundamentally no difference between him and the woman. And that was hard for him to follow. Both were in need of someone to cancel their debts. If forgiveness is available for both, then Jesus is implying that there is forgiveness for Simon as well. There is forgiveness for his rudeness to Jesus. Because what Simon has done was rude and unjustified. And what Jesus does next could cause us to question Jesus' etiquette. That's right. Because what does Jesus do next? What guest ever criticizes their host before a group of people? You just don't attack the hospitality you are given. You don't say, well, that was a good first course, but that second course, that, that didn't do much for me. You don't do things like that. You're always complimentary, even though sometimes it may be difficult um, for you to do this. And one of the evangelists I knew, he said he had an answer when he went to a meal for every meal that he could say honestly that it was a good meal. And this was his statement. I must say this was a good meal. And he said there were times that he had to emphasize the must more than others. I must say that this was a good meal. Well, listen to what Jesus says to Simon. He turns to the woman, but he's still speaking to Simon. He, he, he turns towards her and says, Simon, do you see this woman? Do you know why she is doing what she is doing to me? Simon thought he knew, but he really didn't. Then Jesus systematically exposes the shabby treatment that he had received. He said, you gave me no water, but she wet my feet with her tears. You gave me no kiss, but she can't stop smothering my feet with kisses. You didn't even offer me cheap olive oil, but she anointed my feet with expensive perfume. You see, Simon, you've been keeping me at arm's length. But this woman, she was not ashamed of me. You didn't even bother to show me the minimal courtesy. But this woman has lavished her love on me. And Simon, you know religion. You know the temple. You know the sacrifices. You know the law. You're very proud of the knowledge that you have in scriptural matters and how to practice all of the intricacies of the law. This woman, she knows none of that. But Simon, you've missed the whole point, the main point. To have all of this knowledge about God, about the scriptures, about putting these things into practice means nothing without a relationship with the God of the scriptures. Because it's all about love. It's all about relationships. It's all about meeting with the God who gave us the scriptures. 
And Jesus wants Simon to see into the heart of this woman. She's had a sinful past, but the transforming power of Christ has transformed her into a new creation. She may not know a lot about the scriptures, but she has experienced the transforming power of Christ in her life. Simon knew a lot about the scriptures, but he doesn't really know the God of love who inspired those scriptures. And sadly, there are many people like Simon who know the scriptures, at least partially. They say their prayers, they attend church, but they really don't have a personal, life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is still a stranger to them, someone that they nod to, but not someone that is really a part of their lives. And when someone does express such open love and admiration for Jesus and talk openly about him, it's hard for a person like Simon to understand how and why they do that. How can that be so important? How can Jesus be so important in their lives? Now, if Simon was a bit uncomfortable in this setting... This woman certainly was too. She knows that Simon and his cronies don't approve of the kind of life she lived. In fact, it revolted them. They could hardly understand how Jesus could have accepted such an intimate bestowal of love and admiration. So Jesus wants this woman to know that he endorses her willingness to get hurt for him. He accepts her gesture of love. He defends her. He confirms her. And he makes it possible for her to be part of the community of the disciples. And so he says to Simon, but it's meant for the woman, therefore I tell you, Her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. And then Jesus does speak to her directly. And he says three things to her. He says, your sins are forgiven. That takes care of your past. He says to her, your faith has saved you. That takes care of your present. And then he says, go in peace. That takes care of her future. Notice that Jesus didn't say, go and sin no more. He doesn't have to. Because she's been freed from her past and is living in the freedom of that relationship with Jesus Christ. What about Simon? He got more out of that dinner than he bargained for, more than he wanted. He planned just a casual dinner with Jesus, but it kind of blew up in his face. And as the evening ends, we see Simon staring at Jesus, a look of maybe fear and amazement on his face. And the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to to Simon after that dinner with Jesus. He could have changed, but for a person who was so filled with pride over his own goodness, over his own accomplishments, it would be very difficult for a person like that to come to the place where they acknowledge their need of a Savior, where they acknowledge their need of forgiveness. Of forgiveness. You see, people that are raised in the church tend to struggle more with spiritual pride than those who are raised outside the church. And the flip side of that is true as well. The worst sinners often make the best saints because they never forget where they came from and what Christ has done in their lives. And that's why when God wanted 
a person to bring the gospel to Europe. He found a radical extremist like Saul, stopped him in his tracks on the road to, to Damascus, and made him the greatest evangelist the church has ever known. So we all, regardless of how we have lived our lives, are in need of the grace of God. There's no room for spiritual pride in the body of Christ. There's no need to ask who's better and who's worse, who's holier, who's not holier. Because apart from the grace of God, we would all, each and every one of us, be lost. And we can choose to be with Simon and stand aloof from Christ, not acknowledging our pride and our need of God's grace. Or we can be like the woman who found this practical way of demonstrating her love for the Lord Jesus Christ who had transformed her life. So in closing, here are some questions for us to ponder. What do we see when we look at others? Simon looked at that woman and all he saw was a sinner. That's all he saw. He did not and could not see a woman that was transformed and living a new life. So can we see potential in persons that we know that they could become children of God? And we need to think about that. There are per people that we think they're so far from God, and yet there is the potential that they could experience the grace of God in their lives. And what do we see when we look into the mirror? For some, all we can see is the good that we've done, the accomplishments that we've done, the people that we helped. And we don't see any place where we need the grace of God in our lives because we've been lived such an exemplary life. There's some like that. Or on the other hand, all we can see is our sinfulness and our waywardness. There's many who feel they have no worth or value to anybody. And it's difficult for people like that to realize they have the potential of being a child of God, a king's kid. So, can we see the potential in our own lives of being a child of God, of living for Him, of serving Him, of doing things that will help to make a better world? And only those who understand the depth of their own sinfulness and waywardness can look with compassion and mercy on the women, men and women they meet every day. When we realize what God has done for us, we realize that God can do the same for others. Well, after we have experienced his love and forgiveness. We have repented of our sinfulness, our waywardness. We've confessed our sins, and we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord, and we've committed our lives to serving him. Then one day, we are going to stand before the Lord. And when we stand before him after we've done all these things, he will not forget his manners. He will welcome us with open arms. And as we survey the glories of heaven, all pride will vanish, and we will begin to sing with full understanding the words of a very familiar hymn. Amazing grace. 
How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Amen. Let's stand as we sing that.